Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with the Aerospace Structure Series. This lecture is on analyzing fuselage structures, specifically how we lump the skin and stringer together. This is for hand analysis, and it also feeds into how to prepare good fine element models, which we're actually not going to cover. But the same principles apply. So first we can review back from our Structures 2 series where we saw how to evaluate lump sections. You're going to want to go back to those lectures and make sure we, we studied this in Structures 1 and Structures 2 where we learned that when we idealize a structure as a lump structure, we can put all the area of like stringers and things like that in one little spot. We can evaluate, we ignore the webs. Those are just providing sure continuity. We perform basic area property analysis of the section. And then once we're done with that, we start evaluating. We can evaluate the stresses directly in the table. This was all covered in structures one, reiterated in a number of examples in structures two. You can look at the old lecture here, which where I uh, also where I annotate this idea further if you need a review of this. Before continuing in this lecture, you want to make sure you understand this procedure because this is actually the key to how we do this analysis. Okay, so we're just walking through the steps of what we covered previously. So go back and review that if you need to. If you already know how to evaluate the properties uh, of structures, both calculating section properties and stresses due to bending and such, then you can continue on. Otherwise, go back and review that. <clears throat> this is just a not very colorful uh, slide reminding us how we can idealize thin cylindrical sections. This is the approximate area, approximate moment of inertia. And we can use these relations to save a bit of time in our hand analysis. And if we're developing properties to stick into a finite element model. Now, a typical fuselage cross section looks like this, where we're going to have thin skin, which is often round, but may not be. It may be oblong or other shapes. We're often going to have stringers, which could be Z's or hats or, or other sections. We're showing Z's here. We're going to have a basic radius. Now, you may ask yourself to use the inner radius, the outer radius, the average radius. Well, when you're doing, thinking back to what we learned when we covered pressurized stresses, we find that there's actually a conflict in the different principles. When we're calculating pressures, we'll often want the radius of where that pressure is applied. When we're calculating where those stresses are carried, they're carried at the midplane or the centroid, which we can assume is the midplane of like uh, thin walled structures like this. And, be, and to simplify those assumptions, we learn PR over T kind of stresses. We just pretended those radii were the same, which are actually not quite, which basically means you can eat, grab any reasonable area, the uh, radius, whether it's the inner, outer, or mid plane, whatever is reported, and not worry too much about whether it's inner or outer. Just use the value, and probably if you can find it easily. The mid-plane radius is the best, but really you can use either of those with negligible differences. Okay, so this is the basic way we look at it. Now, when we go through the properties here, what we covered in this lecture is first I develop some, uh, I'm going to show you some basic ideas of how we build up like first, and then we'll look at how we should do it in aerospace. So we're going to use terms like uh, effective width of skin and full effective width of skin. So what that is, you're going to probably want to go back to your three to your structures two playlist. And in there we talked after we started stability looking at columns and flat plates, we then looked at effective widths of skins that actually act with the nearby stringer. You're going to want to go back and review that so you can understand how that works. When we say we're using full effective skins, what that means is we're going to imagine that every stringer and the skin, so if you look at this, we've got the stringers spaced at a certain spacing. So that means for this stringer here, half of this spacing acts with this stringer and half of the other side that works with it, which basically means that spacing dimension times the thickness is the area of the skin. 
if you're using full effective skins, which basically means that all the skin acts with you when you're loading the structure. So what that means is when we take the properties of our stringer and the properties of the skin, we're going to use that much skin acting with the stringer. Okay. So when we say full effective skins, we're using all of it. That's actually true, roughly true, if you have a pressurization case of the fuselage. It's not so true if you have, or if you have tension on the fuselage. But if you're having bending on the fuselage or compression on the fuselage, such that the skin ends up in compression, what's going to happen is that skin is going to buckle out. It's not going to act like all that skin is there. It's going to act like only a piece of that is. And that's why we learned about effective widths of skins back in structures too. So you might want to go back and look at that if you need a review. So our first assumption, in order to understand how to evaluate properties, the easiest way is to start with full effective skins. And even when we're doing a detailed analysis, we're usually going to start there. We're not going to end there. We're going to have to do something more clever to get more accurate answers. But this is a good starting point. We're going to look at ideas like what are the stringer, the air, uh, stringer properties and whether we ignore the stringers or don't ignore the stringers. We're going to look at when we account for the fact that the centroid of the stringer is not at the skin. So a lot of times when folks are trying to do uh, more accurate analysis, they'll go and account for that offset of the stringer. And that can give you a little better results. It also can introduce some challenges into your fine element model that, are, uh, that make errors that are really hard to spot. So I usually recommend just stick the stringers as if they're right on the skin. It makes it a lot simpler to show and to calculate, and the error is near negligible for many models. So we're going to be talking about when we account for that stringer offset, and we're not accounting for the stringer offset. We're going to talk about when we use full effective skins and something less than full effective skins, the actually effective width of skin. And, uh, and we're going to talk about when we... so. When we look at the fuselage bending properties, we have the moment of inertia of the whole fuselage. That's a big number. This thing's very stiff for bending. However, we also have these little stringers, all these little members, and they also have their own bending stiffness. And then the question is, should we account for that bending stiffness or completely ignore it? Now, actually, so I'm going to actually look at both of those ideas and as we look through that, we'll find that usually, you know, that accounting for that moment of inertia of the stringer, it just is so small relative to the overall moment of inertia of, this, of the fuselage itself that it can be ignored with negligible difference in our results, except for localized loads, which we're not covering here. We're talking the overall fuselage loads. So with that said, we're ready to run through. We're going to run through kind of quick. We're going to through some examples. I'm going to build up, hey, if we do it this way, this is how it works. If we do it this way, this is how it works. If we do it this way, this is how it works. And you may get a little confused in the process. And then we're going to drill down to, okay, and with some, after we find some ideas, we're going to say, all right, this is how you actually can go through it step by step by step to get reasonable properties, okay? So that's one of our deals. This is what we're going to do here. We've got this fuselage. We've got a bunch of stringers. And in this particular case, the stringers are all evenly spaced, which is very convenient. Let's say that our radius of the fuselage is 60. That's a typical transport aircraft. Smaller, not huge, but uh, we have our thickness of the skin is 060. Our stringer areas by themselves are 0.2. If we did that, go back, if you need to, to our Structures 1, Structures 2 playlists. And here is how we can construct the properties. The things that are different here is you'll notice we have, we've ide identified each of our stringers and then we talk about the skin as a single entity. Okay. All these pieces together are what develops our overall stiffness. We've got in this case 12 stringers and we've got skin. The skin properties, that area and moment of inertias of this, are from those simplified formulas I showed you a moment ago. That's that last entry in this table, okay? All of that, if it's full effective skin, then you just calculate for that radius and that diameter what are the properties, and here they are, the area and the moment of inertia. And you'll notice the CG, we're referencing, in this particular case, we set our origin at the center of the fuselage, which means the XY coordinates of that skin is zero, okay? Then we go, and you can see we've got all the stringers, 1 through 12, 
We've got the area in the second column placed for each and every stringer. That's not changing. We have the the look the theta, the location of each of these uh, reference from one point, that angular position. So it looks like the first one, it looks like I've got, I should have shown it on this picture, X is to the right because you'll know that first notice that first stringer is at angle zero, which is giving us the furthest most right coordinate and zero vertical coordinate. So basically my zero is here. And then for every stringer located around the fuselage, a lot of times we'll number them from the top. But, uh, oh, you can also see it from the numbering that I put, stringer 1, I called it S1, S2, and so on. So basically, because these are all evenly spaced, you can actually calculate, or you can just put in the, the angular position, that's column 3, and then calculate the X and Y coordinates in the cross section where those stringers are actually located. You use simple trig for that. Then we go through after that, so that's that first one, two, three, four, five columns. The rest of this is all our basic calculating properties, and it has the parallel axis theorem embedded in here. This is the same as what we've been doing since structures one, and report and repeat again in structures two. We then can calculate the total properties of the fuselage. Obviously, in this case, the CG is still in the same place. We've got the area and the moment of inertia. That's how we do it. Now, we're going to use the same approach, exact approach, to calculate all of the properties uh, as we look at the different ideas. Okay? Now, you'll notice here we neglected the stiffness. Okay, so let's talk about that. Each of these stringers, like stringer 1, you'll see we've got the area of that stringer, and we've got the properties of how that contributes to the bending stiffness and area of the fuselage. But in the last two columns, we have an I about the x-axis and an I about the y-axis, which usually will be given in the axis of the actual stringer, and then needs to be converted about the axis that we're computing these properties about, which are the horizontal and vertical axes. Since we're neglecting the stiffness of those, we just put a zero in there. We're neglecting those stringers for their contribution to moment of inertia. What we're getting is the moment of inertia of the skin itself. You can see that last row has those values in the I, X, and I, Y column. And we're getting the contribution of each stringer because it's not located at the centroid, it contributes to the overall moment of inertia. And that's that set of columns that's the uh, column A times X minus X bar squared and uh, A times Y minus Y bar squared. If you sum those up, that gets that contribution for any of those elements that are not the centroid. This is a parallel axis theorem embedded, same way we've been doing this. But the thing that's different is now we're dealing with stringers. We're ignoring their own bending stiffness, but we're not ignoring the fact that if stringers up here, it contributes a lot to the bending stiffness of the fuselage. If it's right on the centroid, not so much, or zero in that case, okay? So that is how we're going to use the same analysis procedure. The things we're going to be changing, and we're going to be changing how we deal with the skin, and we're going to be changing how we deal with the uh, stringers whether we put in stringers properties and where would we have the skin dealt with. Now, in this particular case, since we're using full effective skin, we can put the skin in a separate row and evaluate that by itself. However, uh, we could also lump that. Instead of putting that as a separate entity, calculating its properties using those simplified formulas, we could have instead taken that, eff that effective width of skin, which in this case we're assuming is the full effective width, that spacing value, and we can take the area of that and just drop it into the stringer area. In that case, we'll add another column to show the skin area, and then we don't need a separate, in fact, we don't want a separate row for the skin because it's already accounted for, because basically what we've done is taken all that skin, like for this stringer, we lump it into a single area and put it with stringer one, or with this whatever stringer's up there. For the stringer over here, we take the effective area, squeeze it together, take that area, and stick it with the stringer. That is actually a, a standard and practical way to evaluate skin and stringer properties. Okay, we're going to see that in some of the other examples. Stay tuned. Okay, now...
we're going to look at it slightly different. Now we're going to look at the full effective width of skin. So same skin idealization, but we're going to take the stringer and we're going to offset the centroid. And we're also going to account for stringer bending. Okay. So those are two different things. We're going to account for the fact that the stringer is not right at the skin. We've offset it to the location of that stringer. And we've also, that means we're going to take that uh, Y bar of the stringer itself and we're going to shift from the radius of the skin. We just shift the location of those. So that gives you a little different radius, effective radius, and then all the calculations for X and Y position are the same. Okay, that's what we're going to do here. And look at what the effect is. All right, we've got the same fuselage. You'll notice our stringer areas are the same, but now we've got uh, slightly different values in our X and Y column because we have offset that centroid. And now we're accounting for stringer bending. So you'll notice that the rightmost two columns are now populated because we have the moment of inertia of the stringer in those columns. Now you'll notice here that they're not constant. These stringers look the same. That means they ha have the same IX and IY. But that's about their own local axis. It's not about the axis when it's acting in the fuselage. Because the one up here, the values will be in the same X and Y as the local stringer. Over here, it's going to be flipped because the X is the Y and the Y is the X. And over here, they're going to be some trigonometric function of change. So actually, to do this properly, you have to now not only put in those I, X, and I, Y, but you need to map them and how those moment of inertia is change because it's got a contribution about the x and the y axis. That's what we did here. So we've accounted for all of the skin and stringer moments of inertia using offset CGs. And if we calculate all the properties, we'll look at the final value. Over here I've got an error value. You'll notice that the moment of inertia of the fuselage is 0.02% different. 0.02%, not 2%, 0.02%. This is what we call zero. This is larger than your chances of winning the lottery, but it's basically zero for all intents and purposes. So there's no need to go through all, if you're like, oh my gosh, how do I translate those IXs and IYs? You can say, ah, pff, doesn't make a hill of beans. It's not worth the time. Now, some folks will argue, oh, yeah, we should do more accurate analysis. And I agree with that when we're getting a payback for the extra work and the complexity. What happens is, as we introduce complexities into our analysis, now we're all supposed to be engineers. We're all supposed to be, have a certain level of competence. But the more complexity you add into an analysis method, the more chance of unnoticed errors going all the way through and getting out there on an aircraft which is flying until it doesn't fly. So I am a big proponent of simple analysis. And as we add complexity, make sure we're getting something for the extra work and still do our best to keep those methods simple. I often in my videos keep a little disgust on methods that are overly complex for a small payback. They're usually developed by folks that aren't doing the work, by folks that are trying to come up with methods or trying to do research, but not folks that actually have to implement this in a practical way, an efficient way, so that we have a competitive business that is, has a, a, an acceptable level of safety. So that's what we did here. Once again, we used a full effective skin, width of skin. That means all of the skin is accounted for, but the way we accounted for it was here as a separate column. We dealt with the stringers, we put in the stringer property, and the I and the X and the I, Y, but we actually mapped those as those were located around the fuselage. We found it made no difference, which means we're not going to offset the CGs anymore. We're just going to pretend they're on the skin. And if you want to offset it, feel free. That's not a very hard complication. If you want, But if you go and put in, but these uh, I, X and I, Y really didn't do much. It's calculations, it's work to calculate those, which we probably are going to need to know the IX and IY anyways, but to map those around that circle is an added level of complexity, which is hard to spot if there's an error, and I don't recommend it. So that's what we found here. This is just a building block toward understanding what we can do and what we're going to do and why. 
Let's look at another idealization. So now let's look. If you go back to that lecture in Structures 2, where we talked about effective width of skin, if you ever have skin in compression, it's going to buckle at a certain value. What the effective width calculation does says, well, if I have this much skin at a certain stress, it's going to buckle. And, and the buckling we want to match is the stringer buckling capability, which is usually limited by the stringer column capability and the stringer crippling capability. And so what we did was we determined, well, at the stringer compressive allowable, which includes uh, crippling and buckling, how much skin can act without buckling at that level? And then that becomes our effective width of skin that we imagine is the only skin that's there in our calculations. Now, the skin is obviously continuous, all still there. We actually need it for shear continuity, so we don't cut out these parts of the skin because we need it for shear continuity. However, in purposes of what's carrying normal loads from those bending uh, moments and axial loads, that is all we want to account for is that effective width. Now, if you need a refresher on that, go back to Structures 2, look at the effective width lecture, which I think is right after the crippling lecture. It's like late lecture 19 or 20 or something in that playlist. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to look at every stringer, and we're going to look at what the effective width is. We're going to neglect, we're going to include stringer offset, but we're going to neglect stringer bending. So let's how that works, okay? Now, if we do that, you'll notice here, we've changed. You'll see all these areas of stringers are different. And the reason is because the stringer had an area, and now we've lumped those effective widths into the stringer. Now, this is not the best way to do this. The problem is uh, you now can't separate out the skin action from the stringer action. There's a better way to do it we'll cover later. But right in this particular example, we blumped it all in that area of the stringer. So whatever skin was affected, we just dumped that area into the stringer. So that's what we see here. We've got the same angular position of each stringer. You'll notice the skin row is gone since the skin has been lumped into the area of the stringers. Okay. We then have our properties. You'll notice the IX and IY for all the stringers are zero. Now you might go, whoops, wait a minute, what about the skin? We used to have a separate row for the skin. But now, because we placed the skin, lumped it with the stringer, now we're going to get it, we're going to actually be kind of cal cal calculusing this up, the properties of that, because now we've accounted for its position of all these little pieces of the skin not being at the centroid, and so that's accounted for in this calculation already. Now, you'll notice we got a uh, change in bending stiffness. Why is the bending stiffness so different? Well, it's because we just dumped a lot of the bending capability of the skin. We didn't take the, all the skin and lump it into the stringer, which would have just had a little bit of error associated with that calculation. What we did was we accounted for an effective width of skin, 30T, which is the approximate effective with uh, equation for how much skin acts with the stringer and that ignores a bunch of skins so we have a lot less bending stiffness what this should alert us to is that we've got to be very careful whenever we have a finite element model giving us results where somebody has used quad c quad fours for the skins what that means is it's the model thinks that the skin is all effective. It is overestimating the stiffness, the bending stiffness of the fuselage, which means it's underestimating the stringer, uh, the, the stresses in skin and stringer. This is a big problem that a lot of folks are oblivious to. So it's important to account for the appropriate amount of skin that's acting with sugar. Now, this particular analysis is just an example. What we've done is we put that effective width of skin at each stringer, and actually we're going to have more effective skin than that. The reason for this is a lot of times we're going to have a downbending case as the primary case for the fuselage. That means up on the top, it's in tension 
which will tend to carry more of the skin. Sometimes you can even assume full effective skins up there. Down below, we have compression, and that's going to mean only about 30T of skin is effective. So really what we're going to get is something in between that full effective skin and that 30T effective skin. Now, if you want to get fancy, you can start looking at shear effects, and sometimes we'll say, well, actually, you know, full effective width is too much, a little bit unconserved. We really should limit the amount of skin anyways, even if we're not in compression due to shear lag effects and such. We should do that at McDonnell Douglas, as I and other folks are doing that too. But we're going to develop a method which is pretty good for, uh, not too complicated, pretty good. But this is just setting another data point to say, ooh, full effect of skins. It's, skins is much less stiff than if we assumed that it was full effect of with the skin. So now we've got three, and we've kind of looked at this three different ways. So we've got an appreciation for what the effect of is of accounting for stringer areas. That's something we can ignore, but it's better to account for. Another way to do that is just to smear that area of the, if you're doing really rough and dirty, take all the stringer areas and just, just smear it into, come up with a new effect effective thickness of the skin and then you're back to those two simple formulas that's a way for quick and dirty analysis that's uh mm, approximate this is a better method we've accounted for stringer areas we've neglected the stiffness since it doesn't matter we could also neglect the offset because that doesn't really matter very much and uh, because this value is so much less than this value and uh and we've now accounted in one way for effective width of skin. Now, this analysis is a little too conservative. The first one where we had full effective width is a little too unconservative. So we're going to learn a better method for dealing with this. Stay tuned. Okay. <clears throat> this is, uh, okay, now one more case we're going to look at. And this one is just like the last one where we've got 30T of effective width of skin and bending stiffness neglected. The thing that's different here is now we're going to also neglect the stiffness, uh, the uh, stringer offset. And you'll notice that makes very little difference. It actually made about, what, a 3-ish percent difference for bending? About 3-ish percent by ignoring that stringer offset. And part of this is a function of where I assume that stringer, what, how, where that offset was, how much area was in the stringer versus the diameter and thickness of the skin. Different models will have different. But this is a pretty small error, and it can be neglected. You can account for those stringer offsets, or you can neglect them. If you account for them, I would still pretend for all intents and purposes that those are on the skin, but just account for it like this. If you're doing a final model, you've got to be careful trying to model that offset because it's really easy to introduce issues into your model that are hard to spot. Okay? All right. So here's what we've done so far. We looked at four different ways of evaluating the structure, a fuselage structure. And we're talking fuselage because that's a little easier. And there's a lot of analysis done post-production on the stiffness of the uh, fuselage and such. But really, the wing is the same way. All these same ideas apply to the wing. The difference is the wing has a weird shape, which means it's going to be harder to locate all those stringers and their relative to positions. It's going to be a little more work than just sticking in a sine-cosine function to evaluate that. No big deal. So we're looking at this for fuselage structures, but the wing is the same way with a little more complicated calculation of what the X and Y positions are. Which actually, if you have like a SOLIDWORKS model, you can just read the positions of those stringers and dump them into a file, okay? So we looked at what are the properties when we have full effective skin versus effective width, a 30T effective width of skin. We looked at the difference with stringer bending can calculated, accounted for, and we found out that stringer bending can be neglected with no, with negligible error. We've looked at the difference for accounting for our area of the stringer offsets. We found that did have a small difference, like a three-ish percent maybe difference for some cases, but that also can basically be ignored as well.
four accounted for if you want to do the little bit extra work. Okay, so with these basic ideas, we laid out uh, our approach. We're going to basically, if we look at best practices, we're going to imagine the skin is infinitesimally thin, which means the exact radius is not critical. We can use either the inner, outer, or midplane. The approximate, we're going to approximate the stringers, and we're going to just stick them wherever the skin is. Wherever the radius skin is, just stick the stringers there. That's not going to introduce much error in your model. You're going to have bigger problems with your loads and other things. We're going to neglect the bending stiffness of the stringer itself. That's conservative and doesn't make a hill of beans a difference. And what we're going to do, we're not going to use full effective width of skin. We're not going to use 30T effective width of skin. We're going to use something in between. We're going to actually evaluate the stresses on the fuselage. You with me? We're going to, evaluate, we're going to calculate full effective width properties. Imagining the skin is all effective. This is what we're going to be doing next. We're then going to calculate stresses in the fuselage based on our axial loads and bending. We're then going to look at whether a stringer is in compression or tension. If it's in tension, we're going to imagine it has full effect with the skin. All the skin is effective. That whole spacing acts with the stringer. And if the stringer is in compression, we're going to assume only 30T of effective with the skin is effective. This is actually quite simple to implement with a little iterative analysis, and it does a great job of approximating the behavior of the fuselage. Okay, that's what we're going to be looking at next. We're going to use a combination of full effective widths and 30T effective widths. So stay tuned. Now that you have these ideas in your head, we're going to start looking at how we can do this. All right, and I'm going to break this into steps. Step one. We're going to pro proceed in the same manner that we did before. Let's say, and I don't know why I did this, but this is a different radius fuselage. Now we're using a 40 inch radius fuselage with 15 stringers and here's the bending moment. So I'm not sure why I changed this when I developed this content, but I did. No big deal. The process is going to be the same. Step one, we're going to analyze it. But what we're going to do is imagine that it has full effective width of skin, okay? So, once again, we talked about all these assumptions. We're neglecting bending stiffness of the stringers themselves. You'll notice we only have the stringers shown because we're lumping the skin properties in. Now, look here. We've got the angular position, so we can locate. That's the easy way to locate where these are by angular position. From that, we can calculate the x-bar and y-bar for these structures, which... For some reason, oh, I'm only calculating this particular, the other tables, I calculated properties about the x-axis and properties about the y-axis. Now I'm just preparing this for a single load case, and so I'm only looking at bending properties around the y-axis. So all we're calculating now is the y-position of the stringer from the centroid. So you'll notice stringer 1 uh, is... Uh, it looks like these stringers are misidentified. It looks like our zero is now at the top because you'll notice our first stringer is at 40 inches. Remember, we're putting the stringers no offset, so they're right on the skin. Our first stringer is right there at the very top at 40 inches. Therefore, our first stringer, if you just look at this figure and imagine this first stringer is up at the top, and then we're bringing them down as we spin those around two, three, four, so number one and going around like this, okay? So we've got our angular position of each with our, in this particular case, we made our, uh, the, uh, posi the angular position going up zero was straight up. Our area of the stringer, now you'll notice here, we've got the area of the stringer in column four and the area of the skin in column six. So first we take the area of the stringer. In this case, our last case, our stringer was 0.2 inches. This case, our stringer is 0.3 inches. Okay. Now what we're going to do is calculate what is the area of the skin. Well, we're starting with the full effective with skin uh, assumption. So we're going to calculate what's the distance between stringers. We're going to multiply that distance by the thickness of the skin, and that's the area of the skin. That's what we see in column 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's the area of the skin. That's that distance between the stringers times the thickness, okay? Then you'll see 
area of skin plus stringers in column, stringer plus skin in column seven. That's just adding that column four and column six entry, the area of the stringer and the area of the skin added together. And then we go through calculating our properties like normal. That's the next couple columns, and we're only looking for bending about the one axis since we're only evaluating it at this kind of moment. Okay. Then we calculate our stresses. I showed you back in our Structures 1 playlist so we can, whenever we have lumped properties, we can just insert the formula for calculating the stress and calculate the stresses directly in the table and calculate the axial load in those stringers by just multiplying that stress by the area. If you need to review that, go back to Structures 1, look at those playlists. So that gives us our last two columns. We've got the stress column, that's the normal stress in each stringer, and the axial force column. Now, that means up at the top we have the max stress and the crown for a bending moment, down bending, tension on top, compression on bottom. You'll notice going down to the bottom of the stringer, we have compression of minus 11 KSI, positive 11 KSI on top, and so, and then back up again. So, until we're just off from the center position. So, we can go calculate the stresses in each stringer. Now, if you look at any of these that are in tension, we can assume that those, the skin in those areas, have full effective widths. Now, this is ignoring the idea that shear can actually cause that web to buckle also, and that could be accounted for in a better analysis. But this uh, approximation is going to be good enough for a lot of the work that we're going to do. So we see we've got stresses that are tension and compression. You'll notice stringer 5 through stringer 12 are all in compression. That means for those stringers, especially the ones under high compression, the full effect of width assumption is not valid because those would that skin would likely buckle long before it reaches that stress level. So what we're going to do, this is just a step one. Now we're going to iterate. This is really easy to do with a program. It's really easy to do with Excel. You can make this uh, table in Excel, and then you calculate stresses, and then we look and say, oh, we got some stringers in compression. What do we do next? Now, we could end up changing all the effective widths for these ones in compression, or we can just change the maximum ones and recalculate and start moving out any in compressions we want. And that's the, probably the better way to do this. So our first step, we assume full effective width of skin, construct a table like this, calculate properties, calculate stresses. We look at any, str any stringer that is in compression, and we're going to change it in our next slide, so stay tuned. So we're continuing our approach. This is step two now. We're going to repeat our analysis, which if you're using Excel can just be changing a couple entries in your columns. And if you're doing this by hand, it means you're going to make another sheet with another table and do it this way. So what we're going to do, instead of changing all of the effective widths of all the stringers that are in compression, excuse me, uh, yeah, and, and therefore areas, we're going to just look at the two or the max compression stress and we're going to change the effective width of that. This is how it works. You'll notice we have the exact same table. Look, first column is the same, second column angular position, no change. The Y position of the stringers, no change. The area of the stringers, no change. Now what we're going to do is calculate, you'll notice this effective width column, that's column what, five. For, full of, for any stringer in tension, we're assuming full effect of width of skin, which basically means we calculate the distance between two stringers. Now you can calculate the flat distance or the curve distance. Obviously the curve distance is going to be a more accurate number. The other one will be slightly off, not a huge deal. So if we look at the effect, I don't remember how I did it for this one. If you take the full effect of width of skin, we're calculating that stringer width. And then you'll notice we just changed on the two Stringers with the most compression, we change the effective width to 30 times the thickness, 30T. That's our basic effective width. Assumption, go back to Structures 2 and review the effective width playlist if you need to, or uh, lecture. So we just change that effective width. Therefore, the area of the skin changed. You'll notice they're all the same except those two where we change the effective width. Now the skin has less area. 
therefore the area of the skin plus stringer is different. That gives us different properties. All the rest of the calculations, if you did this in Excel, will automatically update for this. So you immediately know what the new properties are. They're going to be less because you have less skin. And then we calculate the stress. If this is done in Excel, once again, the stress will all come out immediately. That will all be calculated by the formulas we already put in there. And you'll notice we have a different distribution of stress. We actually have more stringers in compression. Okay? Now what we're going to do, we're say, okay, and we got lower properties, uh, moment of inertia and such. What we're going to do next, our step three, is we're now going to take You'll notice now, those two most center ones, our stresses went up. Now they're negative 15 KSI instead of negative 11 KSI. In fact, all of the compressive stresses went up. So what we're going to do next, but those stresses are actually correct if those two strings are actually not correct because our overall bending properties are still wrong, but they're uh, properly accounted for. But now we need to go to the next one. So we can now make the next two stringers stringer 7 and stringer 10, put those effective widths at the new number, at the 30 T value, calculate stresses. Put the next one at the 30 T value, calculate stresses. And we're going to do this until every stringer that's in compression is showing 30 T effective width. When we've reached that point where every stringer in compression is using a 30 T effective width, this tension stresses are on stringers uh, that have full effective width. The, com the compression values are on stringers that have 30T effective width. When we reach that point where that's true, by iterating our table, we will have found the correct properties for the loading we have. Now notice these properties of fuselage are loading dependent. If we get a larger bending moment, more of these stringers Will, and there'll be more bending, more stress, and more of them can be in either tension or compression. So it's bending dependent. If you have an axial load, that adds another column, right? If you had an axial tension, that's going to offset. It's going to reduce the compressive stresses, increase the tension stresses. So that also affects our calculation. All of this can be done easily by hand with a little iter of analysis. In a finite element model, the same thing needs done. We need finite element models that have properties that match the loading. If you assume full effective widths everywhere, and that's the easiest thing to do, you're going to have unconservative results. So you need to think about that and account for that if you want to make sure your analysis is sufficiently accurate. And this is why often folks model fuselage structures with shear panels and with lumped uh, areas in the skin or even with effective thicknesses of skin since it's continuous if you're using a C quad you can also do this by changing the effective thickness of the skin to better approximate the this kind of behavior this 30 T of effective width okay so this is step two we're not done yet I already spilled the beans on what we're going to do next. We're going to now go and just change some more effective widths. Remember, here we have 8 and 9 in column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We change the area because we change the effective width in column 7. Got that? Now we're going to go to the next two stringers and the next two and the next two until we complete the process. And this is our final step, which actually could include a number of iterations and if we continue that, you'll now notice, if you look in column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, effective width, you'll notice stringer 4 through stringer 13 all have 30T effective width. Oh, in this particular example, oh, it looks like we went too far, right? It looks like we put uh, the 30T effective width looks like stringer 13, oh no, this is correct. So you'll notice stringer 4 through 13 all have that 30T effective width. We then calculate our properties, that's all going to be automatic in Excel, and calculate our stresses, and we see every stringer where we assumed a full effective width is in tension. Every stringer where we assumed 30T effective width is in compression. This means we have converged. These stresses are correct. Notice, 
that our max compression stress is now 29 KSI, almost 30 KSI, not 11 KSI. Three times what that full effective with skin assumption assumed. And our tension stresses also are going to typically be higher, as we can see here. That is how we evaluate. Once we get to this point, we now have evaluated our stresses properly, and these stresses are the correct stresses. We can do crippling and buckling analysis on the stringers that are in compression. We can do tension analysis on the ones that are in tension. We can superimpose bending stresses due to localized pressure on the stringers uh, and do other analysis to ensure that we have a robust design. So this is just a quick summary. We uh, Assuming full effective widths everywhere is unconservative. It's unconservative by hand, and it's unconservative in your model. So everybody making models where all the skin is accounted for with full effective widths, you just put in a quad with the thickness of the skin, your answers are unconservative. And you could end up crashing aircraft with that, unless you do something to account for the difference in anything that might be in compression. Okay? We need to evaluate the effective width Thing. Different load cases may require different properties. For example, a downbending case has compression on the bottom. That's going to have one set of moments of inertia. A side bending case will have compression on the side. That's going to have a whole different set of properties. You may need different models, which are basically the same models, but with different properties in these elements for different load cases. Okay? Just running a model isn't the answer. You've got to have a model that is properly constructed, and that gets obscured. Final model modeling can get better answers. It also can just do a better job of hiding our mistakes so that nobody can figure them out. This is why hand analysis is critical. So, you now are armed and dangerous. Uh, this video is a repitch of what I developed a couple years ago. So there's also the old lecture, which I may have emphasized different things and gone through it even slower maybe in some places. So if you didn't quite get it, go back and watch that video, then come back to this video. If you need to go back and re-watch the pieces of the Structures 2 playlist or Structures 1 playlist for lump properties or effective widths of skins, be sure to do that. This is one fundamental building block that is done... Uh, nearly every day, especially for post-production work. A lot of times we're going to do our initial aircraft design and analysis using results from models that somebody else generates and just pull the loads out and start doing our analysis. But when we're doing post-production work, a lot of times we're doing a lot of this by hand. We have to do it quick. We have to make sure there's no mistakes. And this procedure is invaluable for that kind of analysis. Go out there, study this material, and be great. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel to stay tuned with the latest updates. Enjoy.